uh, just whatever you do, just never stop. And if you adapt, you'll eventually overcome um, to any situation that you find yourself in. Um, it's 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 always good to be flexible and open to try trying different things or being open to new things um, and not just really kind of limiting yourself, I should say, which was a, a bad habit I had in my younger years. But as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm learning to kind of open myself up. So to, to different scenarios, but uh, I'd just say, just keep being persistent with your passion and, um, never fear that there's always, you know, tomorrow is always another day and you don't know what's going to happen or what it could bring. Um, but if you are diligent and are continuous with your, your, your love for the craft of playing drums, then whatever happens, you're going to be ready when that, when the time comes. Hey everyone, welcome back to the All Music Matters in That podcast. I am your host, Brian, and joining me today, Michael Jade. How you doing there, brother? What's up, dude? Great to finally uh, be on here and, uh, and talk to you. No worries, and uh, congrats first on you and Drumman 190's, uh, I guess we could say, first place first place in the collab contest that we did a while back, so congrats to you guys. Oh, yeah. oh thank you, man. Yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. He entered, uh, entered our, our collab that we did together in it, and... Um, I was just as surprised as anyone, and it was awesome. Was that like an old one that you guys did? I guess because uh, that was "Give Me Three Steps" by Leonard Skinner, right? Yeah, we'd done it. I think maybe six weeks prior to the contest. Like we just we had just done it, and I just wanted to just say like, okay, let's just put this one forward instead of trying to do like a completely new one. Yeah, I mean, well, it was his idea. You know, I I would have gladly done another one but he was like well let's just submit the, the give me three steps and i was like oh okay sure and it worked out i mean that's all we could say yep. and uh where are you hailing from actually because you're in the central time zone uh i'm i'm actually hailing from uh austin texas i'm originally from uh southern illinois though so been here a little over a decade but uh yeah central texas oh yeah hook them show the horns baby because I know they, <laughs> I know people tend to get upset when they put the horns upside down, which I would not do out of respect for you guys. So, I, I'm I'm not the hugest uh, football fan, but I I try to lend my support whenever I can. Yeah, the University of Texas they kind of fallen ever since like I think it was the Vince Young days. I think that was back in the early 2000s when they were like the dominant team too. They were like the Alabama like it is today, but now they I want to say. They still like have like mediocre records, but they're not the same as they used to be. Um, well, it's it's just it's interesting. The, the the football culture down here is really intense, and it's uh, where I'm from. It's baseball. You know, the the Cubs Cardinals rivalry is is really huge where I'm from, and not so much football. Uh, but down here, it's the exact opposite. Yeah, I know because uh, actually that's how it is in like all the southern states too. Is like football is like the biggest one of them all. It's like just above religion, if I wanted to put it in like terms of like one two three or something like that yeah i think it's it's football and then you go up a little further north and it's baseball and you go up a little further north and it's hockey, hockey. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah the canadians they love their hockey that's for sure yeah uh, yeah i've got a few family members that live up in the washington area that that's that's their thing is hockey yeah i i can see why especially considering like where they're at in terms of like geography too so they probably get a lot more winter months than they do summer months compared to like where you're at now so but enough about sports here uh i wanted to get to kind of get to know you a little bit more here so i got some questions here for you so you ready right on fire away man i'm, I'm ready let's do this all right i think my audience is going to be pretty excited about this one so all right so let's start off with a simple one uh tell tell us a little bit about your drum history how did you get into drumming Whew. So that's uh, it's it's actually kind of a, a story. We got a minute. Um, I started playing drums when I was four. Um, really, before that, I was you know obviously the the classic tale of pots and pans in the kitchen, and they kind of my grandma noticed that. And for I guess my fourth Christmas, I got one of those little toy drum sets that are you get out of like the Sears or J.C. Penney catalogs, and they've got paper heads and you know plastic heads and whatnot. And that didn't last any time. I just kind of destroyed that. Um, so fast forward a couple years later, and I got 
a Noble and Cooley toy drum set. And that was like, woo, you know, a big deal. Um, and I think I just lost that, lo that lose you. No, no, I put myself on mute. So, oh, you put yourself on mute. I'm okay, getting a lot of background noise. So, sorry, I just don't want to be distracting. So, uh, keep going. Sorry. Right on, right on. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, you, basically, I still got little pieces of that kit from when I was six. And then, uh, fast forward to when I was about nine, um, they, my, my mom actually offered to get me my first real drum set, but, I had to work for it, you know, it was, I had to mow the yard, you know, 50 bucks, off, 50 bucks more towards the drum kit if you mow the yard and little chores and things like that. And basically I just spent all summer long that, that year trying to work towards getting the drum set for my birthday, which is in August. And I got it and it, I just, I wore the heck out of it. It was like a, it was, man, it was probably a, a $300 it was called a Thor drum set and it was just the cheapest God awful thing you could imagine. It was all the hardware was like aluminum riveted together. It would just snap. And then the, the Tom arms would just spin and it was, the wood was like cracking. It was so, so bad, <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but it got me through. And, um, I used that for a number of years. And eventually when I was about 17, uh, some friends were a part of a, 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 I guess a Christian youth group band, which I guess a lot, you know, is a fairly common story for a lot of drummers too. I know that's kind of how, what got dramatic going in on his drum path was the church. And so I joined that band for a number of years and that was, um, really formative for me because it taught me how to interact and play with other musicians. Um, and then basically I, I didn't really do anything else until I got into college. And then from in college, I, uh, I, I basically formed a, basically what you'd call a bar cover band, you know, just old classic rock and, and stuff like that, like blues and R and B. And we would just play cover tunes and in, into the Southern Illinois area, which is, they really didn't have much of a music scene up there, but we, we stayed constantly busy and it was a lot of fun. We had, I, I would say that was probably one of the, the high points of, of drumming for me was playing live shows with that band because it could have been five people there or 150 people. And we were always having fun in that band, no matter what. And it's, uh, it was a lot of fun memories and, you know, a lot of teeth cutting back in the, that time, a lot of experience and, uh, you know, everything you can imagine from ch the, the classic chicken wire gigs, you know, where, they're throwing stuff at you and uh, just, you know, long, long journeys, little mini tours. But it was it was fun. It was great. I, I would if I had the chance, I'd do it all over again. Nowadays, probably not so much. I'm I'm pretty uh, comfortable with just uh, being at home. Um, but uh, I did that right up until I moved to Austin. And how I got to Austin was I was. Um, I, I was really good friends with a drummer here by the name of Tommy Taylor. Um, some people may or may have not have heard of Tommy Taylor, but he played drums for Eric Johnson back in the eighties and early nineties. And, uh, as well as Christopher Cross back in the late seventies. Um, but he was living down here and we were good friends and, uh, he was just, man, he was just like, dude, I don't know what you're doing, but you need to come down here. You need, you need to get out of there. And so I, summer of 2011, I basically just spent that entire summer saving up what I could. And uh, at the end of the summer, I loaded everything up into my truck and uh, made a leap of faith and transferred down here. Uh, I think I was cashiering at a, at a pharmacy for like seven bucks an hour. And I brought a lawnmower just in case things got, you know, hairy or anything. Um, but uh, I got down here and immediately wanted to figure out a way, how, how can I make a resume for myself, a, a musical resume, you know, when no one's really heard me play. And I, you know, <clears throat> I was, uh, I wanted something that was kind of more commercial rather than just my own stuff. I wanted to be able to show that I could play, you know, actual cover tunes and stuff, which I didn't really have much of recorded with my other band. So I said about, basically setting up uh, just my camera and all I, I couldn't, I didn't have any audio equipment and I was living in this tiny little back backyard apartment. It was maybe 320 square feet. So no electronic drums, no, no commies to that. I'm just, 
you know, going to annoy everybody with this. So I didn't get, get a chance to play very much. But when I did, um, that's why you see I, I don't have very many uh, drum cover videos really starting out on this on this channel on my channel. Um, but uh, I would play whenever and often as I could. And I started creating, I guess, a musical resume so that I could shop myself out to bands and local musicians here. Um, and I, I was uh, probably for the first seven to eight years when I, I first moved here, I was uh, basically a hired gun musician. I would play with other bands locally and I would join in and or fill in for drummers that couldn't make certain gigs and... Um, it was a lot of fun, but at the same time, I just never felt like, never felt like I belonged, you know, it was never like a, a tight, you know, you know what I mean? You, I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but it's, it was like a, a job rather than, you know, kind of like a brotherhood type of camaraderie type of thing. Mine was uh, kind of a little short lived, but, uh, I wouldn't say maybe doing like a session musician kind of work. I did actually, right. I did want to try it out, but I never got the chance to, I never really knew like what kind of steps to take next or anything like that. But, uh. I did try out in a cover band once, and uh, that only lasted about two sessions. The guys were real cool and everything, but I guess they found somebody else who was more into the studio stuff, I guess, who knew right. how to do the studio stuff and stuff like that. So it was a little bit sad, but at the same time, they were at least reasonable. It wasn't anything like, hey, we just don't like the way you're playing or anything like that. So that much was good. So Well, yeah, and and, and that's, that's bound to happen. The chemistry is a, a huge thing, too, and it's, that was also another – kind of a problem for me is I never felt any real chemistry here like I had going for me in, in the band back home um so I mean after a number of years I, I you know had lots of fun didn't get, make a lot of money um that was uh kind of an issue down here was that it's, it's so oversaturated with bands or at least it was um that there were so many bands willing to play for free that you really couldn't make any money gigging down here unless you were you had a big you know big name behind you you've been doing it for a, a long time um so I, I i i knew that was kind of a, a a means to an end um as much as i love playing music i i know i knew i, I was never going to become like you know a famous rock star even a a, a, a touring musician of that sort um and i know because you know i've talked to I talk to other drummers that have gold records, platinum records, and and there's really just not much of a retirement plan for musicians. Even if you do everything right and you you go to the top and you're you know touring the the, the biggest venues, you make good money for a couple of years, but after a while, I mean, you're just kind of back to the grind. And you know, a lot of those guys that I talk to, they're barely making twenty to thirty grand a year. So it's there's just not much of a retirement plan, unfortunately, these days for any kind of musician, even the really, really good ones that you would think are, are doing quite well. Um, so I, I just, I, I realized I needed to focus on my career more. And so I, I took a break and from drumming and that's why you so also see about a, a two to three year gap between the recordings in the, in my little studio apartment to where I'm at now. Um, I focused more on my career at the time and just knuckled down and um, ended up meeting my wife and we bought a house and moved into that and then once i finally had the space it was like okay now i can get back to creating this studio and finally set about doing what i always wanted to do which was actually be able to hear myself and i, I just i knew i could never do that in that tiny apartment it was just no way so i i set about doing that and got one interface and one gopro and went off from there and it just it's just kind of been slowly building ever since and that's kind of where I'm at. I, I, I stopped playing live back in 2018 and I've really just more or less been focusing on recording and how to record acoustic drums, of course, and how to uh, just get a good sound and a good mix and also record other instruments as well. So that's just been, I've been kind of pouring all my focus onto that rather than trying to find a live gig or something like that, especially given how things have been over the last few years. It was just like, well, this kind of makes more sense right now. This is what I need to be doing. So that's what I've been doing. <laughs> you said a minute too, but you talked for a good 15 minutes there. So I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Go By all means, knock yourself out. I'm saying go absolutely crazy with the questions I throw at you because it makes for interesting stories too. So let's make this some interesting I, I TV for the audience out there. 
it could it could have been a little bit longer. I'm, I'm trying to keep it fairly sparse, <laughs> and so yeah. I don't drone drone on and on and on. Um, also, I want to preface this in, this uh, this podcast by uh, saying that you're probably going to hear a lot of ums, you knows, and likes and stuff like that for me. It's I, it, the you know is a, is like a Midwest thing. Mike Conway can can tell you that it's you know you know my wife will make fun of me all the time because she's from Texas and it's not really a thing, but it's a, it's a pause, you know, it's, you know, yeah, yeah, no, no, no worries too. I know people have always, <laughs> whenever they want to like, make sure they think over the answer too. I always get the traditional, um, and stuff like that. Cause I know that's how it was with like Ash Wells and like some of the other interviews I've done. So don't feel bad. Trust me. It happens a lot. So a long story there. So I want to say, first off the Thor set kind of fits you right now because you got the kind of the Chris Hemsworth look going right now with the long hair and the beard too. So yeah, know. this is just um, everybody always asks me about the my hair and stuff, or the the fan with the hair, and you know, I just decided to one day start growing out my hair. I've never done that before, and now that I've, I've I'm married to a hairstylist, I can kind of get away with it and, and do that. Um, and so I've just given it a shot, and then the fan, obviously, it's simultaneously it helps to because we just we if we don't, we just die of of sweat down here. Or wherever or you, it looks like you're in a basement there. Um, yeah. In our studios, we we basically just it's just we come out of it just drenched, and the fan really helps with that as well as keeping the hair out of my face so I can see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. everything would be a, a blindfold challenge. Yeah, and I think it'd get a lot more views with that too. So maybe it was something to consider. So I don't know. True. But have you ever done the blindfold challenge yet? I have, I, ha- I have actually. I did a. It was actually <laughs> that was an experience because the, of all songs, I decided to pick an Ozzy Osbourne song to do, and I went through the whole thing only to realize that Ozzy doesn't like you having his uh, his music or uploading it to YouTube, and so it was completely blocked. But I was lucky enough to find a cover version of the song that more or less fit fairly well with my drums, and so I didn't have to you know give it up or just completely you know, trash it because, um, I was, it was actually able to salvage it. Yeah. I know what you mean. That's what every one of us keeps complaining about because on our little jump community, we have a little chat session on the WhatsApp and everything. So that's perhaps the big thing that's been happening nowadays where like everybody's complaining about like, Hey, I just want to upload like this Jimi Hendrix song or the Beatles, for instance, gets completely blocked and they can't do anything about it. So it's almost like that. They have to start off from scratch. I had tried about uh, nine years ago to upload a Prince cover and it, it, it did not happen. And, you know, of course now, since he's passed, rest in peace, Prince, um, I guess whatever entity is controlling his, his music will actually allow just the United States, uh, to use his music. So I was able to actually re- record the song that I did nine years ago, or re-record it and actually put it up. But uh, then I found out it was basically blocked everywhere but here. <laughs> yeah. I know that's how it was with like Instagram too, where you just put a post up or something or something where you're just showing a little clip of you playing the song and they'll say they'll block it in like countries you would probably never want to visit, like Somalia, North Korea, and stuff like that. I think like, why are you mm-hmm. even showing me that? I'm not even going to go there. And in fact, I don't even know how many people even <laughs> care that we actually post something there. So I don't know. It, it's so weird. And I kind of wish. It should, it should be like, if we just put the disclaimer that this is no copyright intended, then it should be fine, right? Because we're not really profiting yeah. off of it for anything. So you would think, that's all you need to do. Just put that in, and then it's all good. Because it's meant to be a nice promotion of music. I mean, we love our influencers who have influenced our style of drumming. So. Mm-hmm. But speaking of which, uh, who would you consider has been your biggest influence? Or I guess influencers? Oh, man. Um I'm a 90s kid, uh, so that's going to obviously date me a little bit. I, uh, well, before, I, before I get into that question, let me ask you, what was your first concert, Brian? What 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 concert did you first go to, and how old were you? Uh, let's see, because uh, if you count strings, because that's concerts I was actually a part of, too. That was actually, I want to say third grade, actually. So, I mean, that was back when I was like uh, 9 or 10, something like that. But uh, if you're talking like either the metal concerts or any of the rock ones just 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 your first concert you ever went to you know what you remember uh 
the one that always comes to mind was when I was in uh, Austria, and me and a couple of friends went to go see Guys Like Dying, oh, wow. Job for a Cowboy. So it was a metal wow. concert, but that was actually my first metal concert I always went to. So that's the first one that always comes to mind. But it was always interesting, too, because we were actually on a German trip with uh, the whole German class that we had during my junior year going into my senior year. So we just happened to see the poster, and we asked our teachers or teacher it was really just one and then she fortunately let us go because that day we actually got in trouble because we weren't at the correct spot to get the bus and everything so Mm -hmm. so unfortunately it almost could have went horribly wrong we could have missed out but she by the good grace of god let her let us go and see the show so nice nice well that's that's quite an experience i was gonna say i did see all job for a cowboy but i only saw like maybe half of as i done because we had to get out there and get back to the hotel that we were staying at too Got you. Well, still, you, you know, you got to say you did that, and your first concert was in Austria, which is pretty wild. Um, you know, it's uh, my my first concert experience was pretty wild too. So I was five. Um, my mom uh, and her boyfriend at the time, and had a couple friends, and we all traveled basically in a an old VW microbus from Southern Illinois to Dallas to see Edge Fest, circa nineteen ninety two. Uh, which had the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, the Pixies, uh, the Sugar Cubes before Bjork, Bjork went solo, um, and a couple of other bands. Uh, I think Ice Cube was there or something. But I just remember uh, just standing on the edge of my seat and just watching these bands and these, watching these drummers, you know, Chad Smith, Dave Abruzzese, these guys – were just monster players and even at five years old I, I still vividly remember being there and watching it and watching the watching the shows and have that having a huge impact on me um especially those two drummers um and so i i'd say that's kind of where my big influences really start from are those two drummers and then you start adding in guys like steven perkins from jane's addiction and sean kenny from alice in chains and um, of course, you know, everybody has, you know, that their Mount Rushmore of drummers, you know, you, you talk about guys like Bonham and Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell. And of course the, the God buddy rich, but, um, it I, really, uh, I have to say that it's the early nineties drummers that have had the biggest impact on me. And then of course, getting into, uh, the later nineties, it was kind of more, New metal, alternative metal, Seven Dust, Deftones type of stuff that I really, really got into. Um, <clears throat> but I would say, in, when I first started uh, playing drums, I learned the Black Album by Metallica and Back in Black by ACDC front to back. So of course, Phil Rudd and Lars Ulrich are, are thrown in there as well. But really, when it uh, when it all you know basically boils down to is I'm a rock drummer that's uh, trapped in a, in a funk drummer's body, I should say, or maybe vice versa. I'm a, I'm a funk drummer that's trapped in a, a rock drummer's body because I want to play like really heavy, hard, aggressive music, but at the same time, I just want to groove. And so I, I think that's why the, uh, the first two drummers I mentioned, Chad Smith and Dave Abrazese really kind of check all the boxes for me because they, they play with a lot of power, but at the same time, they've just, they've got a, a swing or a groove to them that's just undeniable i see yeah yours is actually a pretty extensive list too and you actually list a lot more of the grunge and maybe a little bit of the punk bands and too so because a lot of other, a lot of other auto drummers in the community here they kind of talk about neil Peart as one of the other gods or the professor has a i know bruce and uh stomatis that's what they call him they call him the professor mm-hmm. too so yeah just, I, I it's you know those i, I love neil Peart. don't get me wrong um it's just I've and of course Mike Portnoy and all those those Danny Carey, um, I call them Muso guys. It's Muso music, you know. It's music for musicians, and it's it's a lot of crazy polyrhythms and and odd time signatures and stuff. And I just I never, I guess I never really had the patience <laughs> to sit down and and try to work all that stuff out. I just wanted to get up there and groove and. My my biggest thing was always I wanted to make people dance. I just it's all, all I cared about. Just you know maybe a kind of a a pop sensibility to it. Was, all I cared about was making people dance and have a good time, rather than oh look at this crazy time signature I can pull off. 
Um, but I'm slowly but surely getting into that realm because um, obviously I'm starting to run out of uh, stuff that in the my you know comfort zone, I should say. So I'm starting to push myself out a little further and get into stuff that's uh, – like the new regime and uh, Queens of the Stone Age and stuff like that, just really heavy, crazy stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, I consider it crazy. A lot of people are like, "Man, that's just nothing." Um, but I'm working my way up to those those crazy uh, uh, bands like Tool that have you know just really progressive styles to them, and those songs are enormous. And there's a, a, also a lot of intricacies and subtleties, but. Um, for now, I've just been always a meat and potatoes kind of drummer, I guess. Mm. Yeah, every now and again, I might delve into like doing Tool, because I know No Quarter is actually one of my favorites from that group, too. So every now and again, I might just play it on there just for fun, just, and just see where it goes. Eventually, maybe I would like to do a cover of that song, but I got some other, other ones on the plate right now. So a whole, right. lot, a whole yeah. lot on the list right now, including these podcast oh, yeah. episodes, too. So. I'm not trying to close the door or anything. I, it's just uh, what I, I am physically capable of doing as you know time goes on, and I'm trying more than now, more now than ever before, to play as often and practice as often as I can. Uh, I'm really trying to develop some some better habits this year and really work on um, develop developing more as a drummer. I see. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's jump into your kit right there. Uh, tell oh. us a little bit about it. Uh, so this one, let's see, let's see if I can get you mobile here. Right. Uh, um, there we go. Let's see. So this kit is actually a 1991 Ludwig Classic Maple. Um, I'll just I'll go through it real quick. It's it's a Hollywood size uh, kit. So which I, I love. I love the Hollywood style kits, which are a 12 by 8, a 13 by 9, 16 by 16, and a 22 by 14. Or I don't know. I, a lot of drummers try to correct me. You said that backwards, so, you know. So it's it's however you want to say it. But uh, you know, uh, eight by twelve, nine by thirteen, uh, sixteen by sixteen, and fourteen by twenty two kick. Um, and of course, a nineteen seventy three Ludwig Superphonic snare, which is uh, one of the most recorded snare drums in the world. So of course, it's it's something you want to have in your arsenal if you have uh, an acoustic kit. I I, I think anyway. Um, and then uh, on the shelf, I've really just I have uh, another Ludwig Classic Maple that was made in 2005, uh, a 1967 White Marine Pearl kit. It's also there. All three of these drum kits are Ludwig's, and they're also the, all the same sizes, um, uh, using traditional Ludwig Weathermaster heads front to back, just to give it that old vintage sound. And then of course I have a a, a wine red Pearl kit that's that I I just walked into guitar one day and decided to buy it because it was only 150 bucks. And I was like, well, why not? It'd be nice to have kind of like a, you know, if I ever do decide to go out and gig again, it would be nice to just, or even go to a, a rehearsal space. It's nice to just be able to take out a cheap kit rather than the expensive ones. Um, and then rounding out the arsenal is, is just my, my poor man's, I call it my poor man's Zep kit. It's just the Centennial Zep kit, which actually sounds really good, surprisingly. And I think the drummer for Greta Van Fleet uses one of those like exclusively in the studio and out touring. So they're not really that bad. It, it, it that 14 by 26 kick is just amazing. It's uh, unbelievable how much attack you can get out of such a big drum like that. But, um, that's pretty much it. Um, and then my, you know, I've got a, a an M80 Pearl side snare, uh, a one-off really heavy aluminum five and a half by 14 with gold, uh, hardware snare drum that. Uh, some guy made and decided he didn't want it anymore, and so I ended up getting a hold of it, and it's probably my loudest snare that I have. Um, it weighs like 10 pounds. Oh. And last but not least is my Drum Attic custom Christine snare drum, which I just got a few months ago from Eric, and uh, that was – I think he even might have discussed it in his podcast talking with you. I think he was in the in the process of having it made at that time, or it was being painted at the time, and so – it was we were all really excited about it and when i got it it was just i was over the moon and so it's it's but it's so hard to pick a favorite because all all of my drum snare drums are they're just amazing i love them yeah man you got quite a collection there and i also noticed the little <laughs> notice sign too 
air protection required oh. beyond this point too. So that was <laughs> that's actually pretty funny too. Yeah, I've had that for uh, quite a long time. Um, probably since I was a little kid, I just I found it somewhere and it was like, hey, I need this. This is cheeky. I'm, I like to think of myself as a cheeky guy. I'm going to put this in my room because <laughs> you need ear protection because I'm loud. <laughs> yep. We love it. Loud. Um, oh, yeah. Always. Um, symbols uh, to round things out. I'm, I've really recently switched over to a Zildjian guy, being a Zildjian guy, um, but I still have a few remnants of Sabian things. I've got a, so a pair of 14-inch Sabian rock hats, which were actually um, intended, they were matched uh, to a Zildjian set of hi-hats. Basically, the, the previous owner, he wanted to take out a set of hi-hats on tour, to tour, didn't want to take out his, his Zildjians that were really old and rare, and so he bought these because he was a Sabian endorser and wanted to get them to sound as close as possible. And I ended up getting them from him. Um, same story with the ride symbol. It's a 24 inch uh, Sabian AA medium ride with a brilliant finish. And it was also styled after a 24 inch Zildjian ride from like the six, uh, late 60s. And it was a you know same scenario. It needed to be a touring symbol. And so. I ended up getting a hold of that as well, and and everything in here, I've trust me, I have paid, either uh, paid for or earned uh, time and time over. Uh, none of this was, you know, ever given or anything like that. Um, but eh, let me come over here and just kind of go around it real quick. Um, I guess how well this is going to show things. Using for to record your sounds. Uh, uh, so right now I'm. Uh, using some Sterling overheads, which I believe is Guitar Center's brand of microphones. Uh, I've got an Audix D4 on the floor, two Shures up here, I think SM56s up on the toms, an Audix D6 for the kick, um, an Audix I5 for the under snare, and of course the classic SM57 Shure on the top snare, and then just another Sterling over here. Um, that's pretty much it. But yeah, um, everything else is... A custom Zildjian's from a uh, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and then another eighteen over here. Oh man, you got quite an extensive list there too, man. You're loaded. Ah, uh, it's I yeah I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of a symbol guy at the end of the day. I'm just I'm kind of a symbol. I'm the symbolholic drummer, I guess. And I've never I've I've wanted to uh, get into some more earthy kind of sounds, but Right now, I've just I've just still been on on this uh, really bright, cutting sounding cymbal kick lately. That um, I just I don't know. I like the sound of bright cymbals. <laughs> I guess does it sound like breaking glass? Because I know that was what a uh, Joey Clark said in like the interview I did with him. But he got that inspiration from Vinnie Paul from Pantera. It, I actually compare it to the tele, an old telephone ringing. I try to hear the telephone ring whenever I when I hit a, a symbol. If I can hear the telephone ring, then I know it's it's a good symbol to me. That's sweet too. I guess. Uh, what do you love most about drumming? Um, I, I I guess what I mentioned before, um, just the ability to emulate a mood in other people, or just to to change. I guess you know to basically affect someone so that, that they they end up having a good time while listening to you play music. I just, I, I like kind of turning people on musically. Um, that was always, I'm just, a I guess a bit of a showman in that way. I just, uh, always wanted to be an entertainer and I was never good enough to be an actor. So I decided to try and, you know, be an, an entertainer while playing drums. I see. And uh, I noticed your shirt too. It says Vic Ferv. Is that also the style of sticks you play with? Um, it is now. Um, I know. So one of the things that uh, kind of affected me, or the the pandemic caused for me, was uh, I had to switch drumsticks for eleven years, almost twelve years. I'd been using the same brand and model of drumsticks. They were Regal Tips, um, which I loved them. They were the Chester Thompsons. Um, but they were expensive and they were not always the most consistent, but man, it was, it was the perfect size for me. And once COVID happened, um, and the pandemic happened, it, they shut their factories down cause they're in New York. Um, and so it was nothing. Now I had 
a bit of a stockpile. So that was nice. But I would contact them and say, Hey, when are you guys coming back online? And I never would get an end or I would, I, well, you know, maybe, you know, next summer and I'm like, okay. And so I'd wait about six months and I'd message them again. And it got to a point where they just stopped responding. And I was, I, I, one of my last messages was like, look, I'll take whatever you have made or I'll buy a thousand, you know, name, you know, name the amount of pairs I need to buy. Like I'll buy in bulk, uh, whatever it takes. I really want to keep playing these sticks, but it just kind of fell on deaf ears, unfortunately. And it was a bummer, but I had to end up switching over to a different drumstick. And so now I'm, I, of course, that's always just such a, a pain. I don't know if you've ever had to go through a stick change like that, where they stop making your, your stick that you use, but it's like almost learning to write with the opposite hand again. You, you just have to feel where you're comfortable again or find a stick that gives you that certain swing, which is was what it was for me, was I needed to have a certain throw in the stick and I couldn't find one and eventually I just started looking at like, well, let me just go back to basics. Let me go back to just the, the average drumstick. And so 5A, 5B, 2B, and then I eventually landed on the Vic Firth rock stick. And I was like, it's pretty darn close. Um, they are a lot heavier. So uh, I'm learning to have a little bit more, trying to work up more of an endurance now because the sticks are just so much heavier than the regal tips were. Um, but I'm, I'm finally getting a firm grasp, I should say, with them. Um, and the, I don't know if you ever had this happen, but the death grip, I don't know if you ever get a, get a death grip happen where your muscle tenses up in your forearm and you start losing the stick or able, the ability to grip the stick. But I mean, maybe that, that could be a, a sign of carpal tunnel. Who knows? But um, <laughs> uh, I know, I know it, it, it was happening there for a while. And uh, I finally have I'm just, you know, starting to hit the gym this year and really trying to work on my body more. And I'm able to actually make it through a whole session with these sticks now. And, uh, with uh, lots of grip to, or a lot of stick tape, of course. That's another thing I had to learn to do. Is I was like, you know, these sticks. If you don't have the the grip tape, it they will literally wear holes in your hands. So that was quite a trial and error situation back towards I, I guess uh, about a year ago. But now I'm kind of I'm in love with them. I'm yeah. used to them. Yeah. What about you? Never, what, never, sticks, what sticks do you use? I was going to say, I never had to deal with any of that situation that you and I went through. So it really was just a big furf. It was just what came with my drum set one day, and I just stuck with it, really. I don't know if they're really. What are they? It's. Well, I can't tell you the exact term, though. I just know it's. The brand is Vic Furf, so maybe it's 5B or something like that. I know it. I thought it had like a decent reach or something, because it's something I've been rolling with for a while. I never really borrowed the question it or see really what it was in general. It was just like. If I like it and I'm able to grip it and do the things I really like to do, then it works. So, right. So I was really just kind of simple. So, and I know you had mentioned about COVID too, I guess. And when we were talking through Messenger, you had kind of said it. It didn't really have a huge impact anymore because you weren't doing any sort of cover bands or any sort of gig work yeah, the, anymore. So I guess did it affect you in any other way? The the biggest thing I, I think was was the the drumsticks. Um, we were pretty fortunate that, and at least my wife and I um, never never got sick or anything like that. Um, made it through pretty well unscathed, um, but just little inconveniences, just you know, first world problems. Of course, not not having my sticks anymore, and uh, just just random things. Um, but nothing that wasn't manageable because I was, like I said, I, I already wasn't playing live shows anymore. So it wasn't like, Oh no, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of uh, musicians around here that they rely on, on live gigs to pay their bills. And it was a huge issue for a lot of those people. And, and, uh, I felt really, really bad, but, um, I was fortunate enough that I, had, you know, have kind of a, a steady day job that pays all the bills. And this is just kind of now a for funsies thing. And, um, I didn't, you know, of course I was at a time where I wasn't playing live and didn't really, uh, didn't have to have to worry about it. I was like, Oh, cool. Well that just, you know, made things that much easier for me. And now I don't have to really look for a, a band to play in anytime soon. I can just, I can do what I was already planning on doing, which was focusing on trying to be a better recording engineer, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I guess uh, for your regular day job, did it allow you to work from home more or did it not really matter? Did you go 
back and forth between home and office? Um, I, I went back and forth. It was really not that big of a deal. I work, um, I basically work in, for a dealership, but I work at an offsite location. That makes any sense. So we're part of, we're, we're owned by a dealership, but we're an offsite shop or service center that, uh, basically handles their used car inventory and gets all that stuff ready to be sold. So I wasn't around a lot of people through my day and day. just the same five, six dudes all day long. And, uh, I would go home and just be hanging out with the wife. Of course she has had her job, but they were a, kind of the same story. It was just a small little, uh, salon of sorts out in the, out in the, in the boonies and, they really weren't that busy at the time. So, of course, as you can imagine, because a lot of people <laughs> stopped getting their hair cut. Um, so it was uh, it was fairly manageable. Out in the boonies. That's a, that's a new term I heard. So is that a yeah, term? It's, it's, it's a mid, it's a Midwest term, actually. Oh, OK. Well, I don't, that's how it is up here, too. I don't mean to get off track and everything, but I know Pittsburgh up here. I always mention we have like Yins, Yinzer, Yins guys and uh, Wusher, Pop and stuff like that those are always the ones that come to my mind really but i'm sure there's plenty of other ones i'm not really thinking of right oh now. man you're uh you're you're talking like uh you're using uh idioms and terminology that my great grandfather would use he would he would say stuff like that and and uh you know a, a toilet was a commode and a couch was a davenat and um tomatoes were maters you know stuff like that so I still every once in a while I'll catch myself saying or referencing stuff like that. You know, uh, ear corn was roast in ears of, of all things. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, just a, a mid, I don't know if that's Midwest or if that's just uh, old timey, but um, I, they, I was raised by my great grandparents quite a bit. I spent a number of years on their farm. So I, I ended up picking up a lot of their uh, verbal cues as well. <laughs> yeah, I see. It, has, it gets integrated into the brain. I don't want to say infected because it wasn't really like a bad mm. thing too. So it was like a good thing, but it's like, why am I actually saying these words? Actually, I don't know what's going uh, on. I, I know I stand out like a sore thumb down here in Texas. Let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> you get the odd looks and everything. You don't say like the draw of the y'all and stuff like that. I mean, so yeah, you're not from around here. Well, in, in closer to Austin, it's really, uh, it's, it's quite a melting pot. So it's, it's probably not as bad as I make it out to be, but there occasionally it'd be like, you you talk funny. Where are you from? <laughs> Where are you from, partner? That sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the old yeah. cowboy kind of accent too, or something like that. So, uh, just hope that it's for the right reason. It's just more like get to know you a little bit more. Not the hey, something's fishing around here, and I don't like it. That sort of thing. So, right. That's just how oh, that. I I forgot one other thing. Um, I know uh, when we were talking about gear, I forgot to totally mention pedals. I totally meant, forgot to mention pedals, I, and I know that's probably a big thing for drummers out there you know a lot of drummers are kind of i know it was for me like man what kind of bass pedal are you using or what kind of hi-hat stand are you using um what kind of bass pedal do you use uh i mean it's just part of the rolling td25 kit i don't know if there's oh, really? a specific name for it i think it's just all part of the kit but it's double foot and it's just one single bass pad i know i kind of abused it because you see like the hole starting to form into the pad right now so it's from nice. years of years of blast beating or double bass or what have you. So I don't know if there's really well, a specific I, yeah. name for it, but I know it's just part of the whole kit. So I just figured it's just all the roll in D twenty five K. So that's just what I roll with. Well, I know like especially specifically in like the metal scene of drummers, you know, it's it's you know, ooh, what kind of double bass pedal do you have? Oh, is that a is that a a DW nine thousand? Ooh, or a you know, just a one of the trick pedals, ooh! But I don't have anything near as fancy. But I, I really want to do eventually. I want to. I'd like to start uh, doing kind of um, vlogs, kind of like you do, where I'm doing reviews and things. And I want to talk about some of my pedals that I have because um, that's kind of another thing I have a little bit of a collection of. And what I I was the sing I was a single pedal player for the longest time simply because what I, I probably need to just bring it down here. But this is a. Um, I probably need to get in the good light, but this is a, like a mid sixties Rogers Swivomatic pedal. And this is what I used for about 15, the first 15 years of playing drums um, just because it felt great. And it was given to me by um, a ment my mentor at the time. And I 
loved it so much. That's all I really, all I would really play. And up until recently when I was like, well, I kind of need a double pedal. I, I'm starting to branch out. I, I really need to start finding that a, a decent ba- bass pedal that can almost feel similar to what I'm used to. And so I landed on getting a Pearl Eliminator Redline. Um, and I use the blue cams and that to me feels closest to a mid sixties Rogers Swivelmatic pedal. Um, and then as for the hi-hat stand, I use a Rogers Swivelmatic hi-hat stand, which the only reason why is because, uh, that's what Bonham used back mm-hmm. in the day. Bonham would use, he would use Ludwig everything, but the hi-hat stand was Rogers always. Same with Buddy Rich. You know, Buddy Rich would use a lot of things, but he would always, almost always use a Swivomatic hi hat stand. Um, same with guys like Hal Blaine. That's what they use. They use Ludwig drums, but Rogers hi hat stand and, and even bass drum pedal. That's so, so sweet, dude. And uh, it always seems like it's just like, it's mostly just like Tama or the Ludwig, as you mentioned, but it's like one piece that's just different, which is now like the hi hat. So. <laughs> so it's kind of funny, but then it's like, you just like the sound with it. It just seems to blend in with it, so you don't really question it afterwards. I have an old, another like an old Pearl hi hat stand that I'll use occasionally, but it's just you know, it's a totally different feel. And a lot of that, those little subtle things, even so, so much as a spring tension, I feel can affect your playing or your affect your sense of timing. And uh, maybe it's just me, or I'm a little superstitious, but I always feel like I have the the best time or or play the best when I'm using this old rickety. Hard, hardware that's older than my dad <laughs> <laughs> yeah but it still works i mean my question if it still if it still works so i mean like just really roll with it really i guess uh get mm-hmm. back into covid did it allow you to restart your youtube channel or were you already doing it by then i was actually it was really weird because um if you look i posted my first um, kind of video back with actual sound um, back in September of 2019. And then I posted one more uh, in December. But what happened was uh, I posted my that first video back. It's like, yay, I finally got my interface. I'm recording. This is awesome. And then I got into a really bad car accident. Um, I was hit. I was T-boned. Um, I just got this beautiful Mustang GT at the time. And was yeah, I hadn't even made my first payment yet and was on my way home from work one day and just bam uh was going through an intersection and, and a car came out of nowhere and hit me in the passenger side and it um it totaled the car and did some pretty gnarly damage to my back. Um so I was I was out for a while. It was really uncomfortable to, for me to play. Um so I spent that that entire winter, you know, trying to basically get my, my back back straight. I was, I was putting about 40 pounds of weight on my left foot, but it just so happened while I was dealing with that was when COVID happened. And, uh, I guess that was a big inconvenience was I was trying to go to a back, you know, a back specialist to get my back straightened out. And I would have to end up getting you know, rescheduling because there would be, uh, lockdowns and things like that. So I'd just be sitting at home with this, you know, painful back waiting to go get straightened out again. Um, and, but by the following spring, I guess it were for February, March into May, I, I started feeling like my, my old self again and started picking things back up. But of course, back by then we were headlong into the pandemic and uh, it was just like, well, I need to, I really need to work my body back up after this car accident to anyway, I need to just woodshed. I just need to be at home and working on my craft and then at the same time experimenting with all this new recording equipment and trying to be more proficient at it. And it just kept me busy. It really, I, I wasn't, um, I wasn't missing much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, it was good to see you recuperate too. Cause those kind of things, they come as a shock to us. Cause you know, we think everybody's it, it was scary. I know. And you really don't know. And we're thinking like, Oh, this guy's pretty good. And then like, you never really know that he, suffered something like traumatic like that so i could imagine that's why whenever were you like trying to turn or something and then he just came flying through there or were you like going straight so i was going straight i was i um it was an intercept it was basically there's uh, a one way going this way and well so i'm going this way there's a one way going this way and there's an overpass you go under and on the other side there's a, a light over there where the opposite like feeder road they're basically feeder roads you're you're crossing uh, going the opposite direction. 
And I, the, my light turned green, the first light turned green and I went ahead and started going. And then I went under the bridge, uh, the next light, it turned. Green, and what happened was it was a couple of 17 year old kids were trying to race the red light and they lost because I got the green light and passed through. And I was almost three quarters of the way through the intersection when it was just like a bomb went off. And I, I blacked out. I was, I was hit so hard. It pushed me into oncoming traffic. I, I ended up hitting another guy head on and it was, it was pretty horrific. I, I won't get too much more into it than that, but it was, it was so bad that when I finally came to, I was looking down at my, my body, just wait, looking to see, okay, what's missing? Where am I? Am I, I I'm probably missing a limb, a leg, a foot, a finger, something. And I was amazed to see that everything was still fairly in place. Um, and I ended up opening the door and when I got out, I just collapsed because it just, it just took the wind completely out of me. I I could barely breathe and just rested on the, on the curb until paramedics showed up and went to the hospital and was totally checked out and showed that I was fine. And so I got some pain pills and went home and waited to see a back specialist I see, yeah. but it was pretty bad. It mm-hmm. was, it was, it was, uh, it was the first, it was probably the worst car accident I've ever been in. And also the first car accident that I didn't cause <laughs> ironically. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good to see that you are recuperating. I know I said it before, but it's always good to see you uh, back out of there too. So it's good to have you back in the community, I mean, brother. Oh yeah. Thank you. I, I'm of course, you know, I'm, I feel, I feel blessed and lucky any day that I get to come up here and, and, sit behind my kit and be able to play it to a level that makes me happy still and still brings me joy. It just, I, I've, I've always been or felt grateful ever since I was a little kid because I actually, I'll show you real quick. We were talking about, you know, I've been down this road before, um, but I've got a pretty gnarly, I don't know if you can see or not, but I've got a pretty gnarly car run, running down this, the, uh, both sides of my left arm here. And that was because when I was five, Oof. I, uh, I jumped down a set of, uh, a set of steps and trying to impress my neighbor's daughter. Um, always trying to fall too hard for the girls, but I'm, you know, uh, and basically just trying to impress her and a jump turned into a fall and it became a break that was a compound green stick fracture that also shattered my, my, my main artery in my arm. And I was taken to the local hospital and they were like, "Uh, he's probably going to lose his arm. And, uh, thankfully my mom was like, no, that's not happening. Um, we need another opinion. And I was actually life flighted from Southern Illinois at that hospital to St. Louis, which was like the first, the nearest metropolitan area. I was life flighted by helicopter to the hospital there. And they basically took out part of my artery in my left leg and reconstructed it in, in my arm. So I would have a pulse again in my arm. And then from there over the course of like six operations, knitted my bones back together in my arm so that I could keep it. And I, I mean, it, it, I made pretty well a full recovery. I was, uh, I have some limited range of motion. Like I can't fully touch my back with this arm, like I can this arm. But other than that, um, I can play. <laughs> yeah. That's the main thing. We can still play too. Whew, boy. I should say I, I don't, I can play without having to take the, the school of Rick Allen from Def Leppard. I don't, I can, I can still play um, as if you know I have all my limbs because I do, but yeah. uh, it was it was close there for a minute. I was I, I was going to have to look into a, a possible Rick Allen setup. I thought, yeah, I know. <laughs> being a little kid, yeah, too. That boy, that's a pretty powerful stories too. And like I said, good to see you're doing well. So I guess uh, thank you. Yeah, is there something you want to achieve with your YouTube channels? Because I think now you have a good amount of subscribers and stuff. So is there something you want to achieve with that? Man, it, like I said, it started off as being kind of a, a drum resume or just to show anyone that I was trying to shop for to be in their band, you know, how versatile I was or, you know, I could play this or I could play that. But now it's just gotten to a point where I just do it because I love to do it and it it brings me joy and it's it's fun for me. And I it's something that's a, it's a craft or a, something that I feel is always something that I can learn. There's always something new to learn, um, both playing drums and recording. It just kind of, it's all, it's all wrapped, rolled into one, you know, 
audio, audio engineering, playing the drums proficiently, as well as the visual aspect of, of putting it all together and editing it. Um, it's just, it's fun for me. And now I, I, I would say my, my biggest goal is, is just being able to continue and, and have fun doing it. And, um, if I get more subscribers along the way, that's awesome. Um, but I, I, what makes me feel good is just a constant, like it's, it doesn't have to be a, a, you know, a 45 degree angle, but you know, just slowly going, building up to something, you know, special that may, I'm, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not looking to get famous or anything like that, but I would, I would obviously, everybody wants to see their channel grow and keep growing. Nobody wants to see it go down. So, um, if I could even just maintain what I've got right now, that would make me happy. Shoot. Um, I, I feel like I, I get more attention right now than, uh, the last decade of playing live shows. So it's, it's, it's pretty fulfilling and rewarding. And I'm, I'm connecting with awesome people like yourself and just forming these really cool friendships that aren't right down the, the street or anything. They're, you know, sometimes in, in a completely different country and, you know, with regard to guys like Ash and, um, uh, uh, Mike Lewis, um, who's another awesome drummer. Um, if you haven't seen or check, check him out, I recommend checking him out. I just did a collab with him. Um, I see a couple of mics. But yeah, it's, know, it's so. awesome. I did see a couple yes. of mics. Yeah, they, but yeah. There's a lot, a lot of us, <laughs> a lot of mic drummers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Actually, I thought you were going to say like Mike few, cause I know he's posted a good amount too. I don't know. He's always willing to do any sort of collaboration and stuff like that too. So that's who I thought you were going to get in reference. touch with him. You haven't got to touch no, with him? No, no, but I'm going to have to get in touch with him. No, I'm going to have to get in touch with him too now, I guess. Oh, yeah. Awesome, dude. Very awesome, dude. Shout out to Mike View. Love you both. That's what he says too. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess uh, we now reached this part of the podcast where now I give my interviewees a little bit of freedom to ask me anything or if there's anything you'd like to get off your chest. So you did kind of jump the gun on it. So I guess what other questions <laughs> did you have? Uh, uh, so... I've, I've watched a few of your, your podcasts and, and I feel like you've probably answered some of these questions before, but, um, uh, how long have you been playing drums or what, what was it that I guess, I, I know you, I think you said rock band was, as it were, that was what really kind of led you into playing the drums. But, um, uh, I guess what were you wanting to do with playing the drums? Like what, what did, when you started out playing the drums, what was it you're trying to achieve with, the passion uh i'd say in the beginning it was just really doing it for fun because i really wanted to do like some of the songs i really loved and without doing it on the rock pad things where you have to like get it so right or the fans start booing and hate you and all that stuff so mm -hmm. at least in this case it was i'm trying to do it i'm trying to keep it as close to the beat as possible but i'm having fun doing it and then when i started getting better with it i was like i could probably do some drum covers out of this because i i've seen some people do drum covers obviously they were there more high end if you know what i mean high end subscriber count kind of players mm -hmm. so i figured mm, i think i'll give it a shot but i'll just do it as a hobby and then see where it goes and stuff like that and obviously the first few subscribers they're family and friends they're just trying to say we have your back and stuff like that so it was really slow because you find out it's a very saturated market so Oh yeah, I kind of learned that. Then I thought I think I need to start differentiating. So I tried vlogs for a little bit, but that turned out to be a lot harder because I was always trying to do like scripts and stuff, so I knew what to say. And if eventually at a point it, it got too, it got a little too hard. But I think I would like to bring it back because I seen uh, Sacha, a uh, virtual drummer. He started doing mm -hmm. uh, vlogs, but his is more like because yeah. he, he got back into gigging, so now he's kind of showcasing some of his skills and everything i see so. his stuff on instagram i follow him I'm, I'm following him on instagram so i'm able to see his stuff on there yeah too and uh he always mentions it about it but i i gotta go over there and check it out see like how he's doing everything because they're short they're not like terribly long but they're like 15 maybe 20 minutes and something like that so i thought about mm -hmm. doing something like that but i wanted to incorporate some of the old school stuff you remember how mtv with the jackass and viva la bam was on there and it was like Mm -hmm. oh this is so badass i want to i wanted to try something like that but try and figure out how to incorporate the music to it so make it right somewhat entertaining but it's still to the topic of music if you know what i mean right i i love doing that with certain drum covers that i do i'll, I'll add in little snippets of of 
favorite TV shows or, or shows kind of from, you know, my past, the, if it makes sense, then it makes sense. Or, you know, like, um, a funny thing that that particular band did, or just try to be cheeky and somehow while using either, uh, something from my past or something that the actual band had done or, or posted up that was, I thought was usually pretty funny. Yeah, I know what you mean, and uh, I've seen our guys kind of go back to the old school, or at least try to throw in stuff that maybe influenced their childhood and stuff like that. I know one with me was actually, and I, I noticed this recently, it was with uh, Cool Borders, more specifically Cool Borders 2, because it it had like a soundtrack, I wouldn't say maybe the guitars or anything was legit, but it was at least still something that sounded cool. I was thinking, maybe I could do drums on that, and then kind of relive those days and try stuff like that and see where it goes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. the uh the other thing is always uh that's always fun is uh recording or trying to record like an intro you know like the your intro music to your to your video um that was always, that was kind of a, <laughs> a challenge it's like well what am i gonna, what am i gonna do i don't have anything laying uh, anything here but really drums how am i gonna make it kind of a, a catchy intro um so that was that's always fun just trying to discover like what's your what's your not only your logo but your intro music going to be I know I asked uh, Bruce Baxter for a logo at least see where we can go from there but uh, intro for the podcast ones this idea actually came from uh, John Grubbs who I talked with on Facebook and he brought the idea up where if you had a bunch of little pics of drummers playing and it kind of spreads out and I was going to do like 12 and see how that works for the opening intro because when I do it it's kind of like a little bit of a drum kind of solo I kind of took the idea from Mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin the rock and roll song so that's kind of where the idea came okay. from so i was going to try something like that but i only got like four videos so far so i don't know if you want to pitch in too you're more than welcome to so okay uh, really uh, all it is it's it's really just like 15 20 seconds of the drummers just playing whatever they want and then there's no audio to it it's just the video that i specifically need and then it branches out and then just playing all music matters in that and then it just rolls from there so but I don't know for nice. the drum covers because I just I just kind of roll with it right into it because sometimes there's little instrumentals in the beginning before the drums come in. So I'm, I usually take that opportunity to just say like, hey, subscribe to my channel and stuff like that. And you know what I mean. You just try to kick it off from there. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I guess also it just depends on the on the song that you're uploading to. If there's like a, a long intro in the beginning – um, you don't always have to have your intro music if it's you know you've got a song where you're not really playing the drums for the first you know ten to fifteen seconds. You can just use that as your put your logo there and kind of fills that dead space. I've found too, which is nice. Oh yeah, absolutely too. So, I guess uh, do you have any other questions or anything else? Um, what what are your goals with this uh, this podcast? What are your aspirations? Take on the level of Joe Rogan. How about that? Do okay. No, no, nice. No, 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 I'm kidding. And he just, he just, he just moved here. He just, he, and that's that's like also what what's kind of made this uh, around here this area crazy is him and Elon Musk have, have recently moved here. And yeah, it, it's well, I keep hoping that I'm gonna run into one of them one of these days, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah, well, they keep themselves busy too. So as you can probably tell with the news and everything. So, uh, really, it was just kind of an idea because. I was seeing Drumman 190 with uh, his little podcast. And then uh, it was a drummer's key. I think that was also the main influence where he started interviewing drummers in the community. I think he just kind of reached out to people and said, like, hey, you want to come on, just do an episode and stuff like that. So I figured, why not? Because the first two I had was a friend of mine who's a drummer in Nashville. And then the other one was a drum teacher in and around the local area here in Pittsburgh. And I was trying to think, I'm thinking like, if I'm going to start copying like Drumman 190, it's not going to be very interesting if I go for like the same drummers or the companies. Right. I know he did a TJC custom drums on his podcast. So I'm thinking like, if mm-hmm. I start doing that, all I'm really doing is just copycatting. So maybe let's try something different here and then see where it goes and then eventually work myself up. So I would like to turn this into a full-time position at some point, but we're at least working our way there. So a little bit of a ways to go. Well, I, I, you know, I gladly appreciate the opportunity that you're, you're given, you know, kind of lower, lesser known drummers such as myself to giving us a platform to get on here and just kind of 
schmooze about ourselves and 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 drone on and on um uh, about you know <laughs> our background and stuff it, it, it i really appreciate the platform because it's really awesome and it's um it's given me a lot of insights into yeah, yeah, you've done some uh other interviews with other drummers that i follow on youtube that i'm big fans of and i got to learn a lot of things about them that i never knew and it's it's just I, I think it's a really cool thing that you're doing and i'm i'm really happy to be a part of it and just grateful no worries and uh, thanks for coming on too that'd be twenty dollars <laughs> got cash app oh yeah uh, you know that's always a kick line i always like to say too whenever i start picking on people too i'll be like that'll just, be 20 just 20 in this economy in oh the, yeah in this economy that's like a bargain man oh yeah but I'll hey it, it adds up I'll over time it. too then that's tax-free right i'll we'll just do that it's Talk tax-free it, yeah. so it adds up so all right <sighs> I'm starting to look at my, some of my subscriptions like, man, I need, I need to start cutting some costs here. Netflix getting awful expensive these days. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> well, I mean, the subscriber count went down, too, so I think you can easily just join amongst them, too. So I guess you have to see what happens. So, all right, I guess, uh, do you have anything else before we jump to the last question? Um, I, I think uh, I'm pretty well caught up from here. I, I, I can't think of anything else I, w I would want to ask right now. You probably will later after we end the conversation. I'll be like, oh, yeah, but not, nothing right now. Yeah, I know. It's one of those, oh, man, I forgot to ask that question. And then we'll have to do a part two later on so you can ask it later. <laughs> All right. But. All right. I don't even know what where we're at on, on time. I, 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 <laughs> I don't even know where we're at on time. I mean, we talked for a good yeah, hour. Definitely, I, mean, sure. I mean, I got no time. Probably, that's either, pretty but. good. So that's pretty good. It's a it's a good uh, that's, that's definitely a good marathon. So for anyone watching, if you've made it this far, thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not live streamed just yet, but I think if anybody does watch it, we'll eventually right, right. We'll reward them for good for good support and stuff like that for good support. Right on. Okay, so jump into the last question, and this is one that I've always liked to ask my interviewees because I know sometimes the answers can be a little cliche, considering like what everybody has said too, but. Uh, given what the pandemic has done and maybe our own little struggles and everything with you overcoming your traumatic accidents and I guess anything else with kind of moving around, trying to get your music career up and running, uh, what sort of message of hope could you give to other musicians out there, maybe in a similar position, but maybe just trying to get out there and make a name for themselves? Uh, just whatever you do, just never stop. And if you adapt, you'll eventually overcome um, to any situation that you find yourself in. Um, it's 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 always good to be flexible and open to try trying different things or being open to new things um, and not just really kind of limiting yourself, I should say, which was a, a bad habit I had in my younger years. But as I've gotten older, I'm, I'm learning to kind of open myself up. So to, to different scenarios, but uh, I'd just say just keep being persistent with your passion and um, never fear that there's always, you know, tomorrow is always another day and you don't know what's going to happen or what it could bring. Um, but if you are diligent and are continuous with your, your, your love for the craft of playing drums, then whatever happens, you're going to be ready when that, when the time comes. So I'm a, I'm a big believer of being prepared to so just always, always be prepared for anything short pause want to make sure he says anything else I know. <laughs> but it always seems like if somebody has something else to say before i like try to jump to the line and it's like oh crap they went and say something else <laughs> oh wait oh yeah <laughs> um, sort of thing. yeah oh yeah uh throw your avocados out after a couple of days because they're usually no good i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. um but yeah that's uh, that's the i think the, the the biggest message if i could give anything was just just always um Keep yourself open to, to new experiences. I see. Spoken like a true prodigy. It's always like what I want to say to everybody here because everybody has certain words of wisdom to say out there and everything. So, all right. Before we wrap up and everything, uh, what's it like down in Austin right now? I guess what can you tell for any of us who want to maybe visit down there and maybe make a little vacation um, out of it? it we're, we're almost in peak summer temperatures, but we're still kind of preheating. Uh, it's, only, it's only about 100, 101 right now. We've still got about I'd say another 10 degrees to go before summer really kicks in, but, uh, we're almost there. Um, it's, it's nice. We, uh, as far as just kind of day-to-day -day life so far this year, we 
kind of had a, a bit of a COVID scare at the beginning of the year, but after that, it, it really tapered off, and we've kind of just been almost pretty well back to normal uh, for so far this year. Haven't really had any any issues, and it's kind of almost like nothing ever happened. It's weird. <laughs> I know too, yeah. Um, but, and I guess uh, there's also yeah. a lot of the drama going on too. And I know there was that school shooting, which was a huge tragedy that happened. That was, too. yeah, that was that was pretty horrific. And my heart goes out to every, each and every one of those families. That was devastating. Um, I, I heard about the the Buffalo shooter as well. That's just it's awful. Um, but I, yeah, it, it's it's just so it seems to be like a something you know a long line of of tragedies that have been affecting us for what seems to be ever, for the last uh, ever since really 1999 that I can remember. Um, it's just every time one of those things happens, it's, it's awful. And it, it really um, speaks to me because when I was in the third grade, um, a man came in and a, a kidnapped his daughter from our school at the time with a, a gun, what we thought was a gun, but it ended up being just a, a, a BB gun. But nonetheless, it was pretty traumatic um Oof. and this was back in the mid 90s before even before like, this was pre-columbine so we were just horrified you know that he ended up you know kidnapping her and it was uh, uh, a pretty crazy and horrific thing and they had to basically create a manhunt for this guy and about a month and a half later they finally found him and re- uh, rescued uh, the girl but of course we got all got to say goodbye to her one last time but she had to go move away and change her name and all this crazy stuff. But, um, it was, it was scary. It was absolutely horrifying. And I couldn't imagine, um, if he had something more than just a BB gun, it would have, you know, could have been a very different story. And, um, I just, I, I'm always thankful that it went, it, it went down that way. And it wasn't what a lot of what's, what we're seeing in the news, now nowadays um it's just I, I i can't even i couldn't even begin to imagine what that's like going through that so yeah it's it's tough time it's it's tough times and but but I, you know it's you keep those those families in in your in your thoughts and hope that something can be done to eventually stop this stuff kind of stuff from happening well i would hope though i think there's a good amount of skepticism to see why too so but uh, I was going to say, man, <laughs> your stories are pretty much dramatic, too. So, I mean, like, you could almost, like, write a book after everything. I've been through a lot. I, I know, mean, man. I, I, try, I mean, I try, good I'm God, trying, man. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying not to be too dramatic, but I, I've, I've, you know, I've had quite a life, man. I'm, I've, uh, you know, what, what hasn't killed me has definitely made me stronger. And, I, I you know, I was never I, – I never came from a place of privilege. I've had to work for everything I've, I've ever gotten. And – um uh, it's, it's been a long journey to where I am, but it's, I'm, I just, I feel blessed to have this life that I have now every day and to have, uh, my wife, you know, be, uh, my best friend, be married to my best friend, I should say. And, uh, we're, we have our health and we're safe and we're doing what we love. And I mean, what, what's better than that? I mean, we just, I, I guess we feel pretty fortunate given everything that's, that's gone on around us over the last few years you know it just seems to be um we have to be grateful for every, for every day that we have oh yeah absolutely too family comes first we always say that first mm-hmm. so it's good to see that you're doing well too and mm-hmm. i know it's good to see it's made you stronger too as an individual and human being too so glad to have you buddy yeah you, you, oh thanks man I, I, i'm always glad to be here and you know you, yeah you can't get let let stuff you basically just you know maybe not turn the other cheek but you can't let stuff um crush you You have to it's almost like getting i don't know what what idiom you would prefer but you know getting back on the horse or what have you but um you know you only get one life and i just i i always set out to try not to let anything get me down and and live live to my fullest potential every day or at least attack each day with um a feeling that you know it could be my last yeah absolutely well it's really, it's really not like you only live once anymore. Because I know it's more like you only die once, so to speak. So I know it's, I know it's a little strong too. I know we're kind of getting on strong topics here and everything. So maybe right. we're turning hopefully our a off. long time from now. <laughs> yes, hopefully a long time from now. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a 13 year vegetarian, 
uh, just in in hopes that I might that might actually extend my life just a little bit longer. You know, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, trying to trying to do what I, I can to to be around to stick around for as long as I can. But uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it, life's not 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 been uh, it's it's definitely thrown me some curveballs where it's like, hey, <laughs> you're not uh, it's not as easy as you, as you think living, man. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's a swing or a miss, or you hit the home run ball that goes 400 some feet off the left field wall or something. So, all right, so. Yeah. Mike, uh, we reached the end of my podcast interview, man, and boy, awesome! Boy, Ooh, we, we what, talk, a mar- what a marathon! I we made talked it. a good bit, man. We talked a good bit, and uh, I, I will say this: your stories are pretty powerful too. So I think a lot of people are really going to like this and maybe take something away from it. So I guess before we wrap up, do you, that'd be great. Uh, do you have any other shout outs or any last words you want to say before we close? I just want to thank it to you know I, I want to thank a few people that uh, I guess I follow and follow me vice versa on on uh, YouTube that have just been really instrumental I think um, with grow helping my channel grow and uh, first off I want to thank you Brian because this is just fantastic thank you for having me on here and doing this and providing this to uh, up and drum, coming drummers to make us feel somewhat important I guess <laughs> yeah but yeah. Uh, uh, I, a huge shout out to Drum Man 190, um, who I, you know, really found me even when he was kind of first taking off. And I've just I've watched him evolve and have all these amazing drummers on. And I've I've connected with so many people be, as a result of of him uh, forming a friendship with me. And I'm, I'm grateful for him. And uh, of course, Drum Attic, which is another awesome guy. Uh, but also guys like Mike Conway. Um, oh man, there's. Uh, you mentioned Marcus drums earlier. Marcus drums is awesome. I'm, I'm sure there's, there's like probably another 20 that I'm forgetting right now off the top of my head. Um, Ash, uh, well, Kyle, Ashwell's will be another Kyle, one. Ash, Ash Wells, of course. Um, Kyle Castro in the Philippines. I just did a collaboration with him, um, and his family. They're awesome people. Um, uh, Virtua drummer like we were talking about earlier he's he, he's been really supportive of, of my channel and just uh, a, a lot of other guys that I can't even I can't even think off the top of my head right now um, but I just want to say thank you to all of them and you know your support and your friendship of course um, are uh, priceless to me <laughs> that's good to hear man and uh, like, we, like I always said thanks for coming on to our the community and everything so it's good to have you here so all right. So, no, absolutely. Glad to be here. All right. And it, was, and it was great being on here. No worries. We maybe do it again someday. Maybe pick up on stuff that we missed too. So, all right, everyone. Be awesome. All right, everyone. My guest today was Michael Jade out of Austin, Texas, and everything. So, it's good to see this brother's doing well. So, go support his channel and everything. I'll leave links in the description. So, Mike, stay safe. Stay tuned, y'all. We'll do, man. Take care. Peace. <laughs>